thanks for joining us today. It's uh, nice to have you here. Um, we're just having this little conversation today to introduce you to the SIBS community, the students, those who don't haven't met you already, um, and everyone who's shown interest in the school. So, could you just tell us like where you're from and give us like a little bit of self introduction? I actually, you know, don't have a particularly colourful, you know, family history. You know, I'm a you know fairly ordinary uh, person. Um, I was born in Russia uh, uh, and I was raised, uh, well, in several countries uh, and ultimately I ended up uh, here in China. And how about your, uh, your family name? Could you pronounce it for us? Oh, I see. Because uh, it's so I think not, you know, many not, students yeah. have this question. Uh, yeah, and, I'm just uh, you know, thinking that of that, yeah. I have never uh, answered it. My, my family name actually is Russian, so my father is Russian. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a fairly rare name in Russia as well because it just so happens to be the last it starts with the last letter of the Russian alphabet. A Cyrillic alphabet. Cyrillic alphabet, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's pronounced slightly differently in Russian. My family moved to Belarus uh, before the collapse of the Soviet Union. And so when I was getting my passport, my Russian last name was transliterated into the uh, local language, which was you know, Belarusian. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that's how it ended up in my passport. And uh, now I'm stuck with it. So it's uh, not a particularly common name, you know, in Belarus. And of course, you know, when you, you know, pronounce it like that, it's no longer a Russian name, you know, either. Uh, but this is my official name. So, you know, you know for reasons entirely political, yeah. I ended up with this strange sounding uh, right. last name, yes. You said you, you lived in a few different places, but where did you spend the bulk of your time uh, during your most formative years? Uh, I think my most formative years are ahead of me, so okay, yeah. and I'm going to spend them, you know, not in Belarus presumably. You know. Okay. Uh, How about your academic career then? You lectured in uh, Milan, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, I studied in the, in the United States, States mm -hmm. uh, did my PhD there. Uh, then I went to uh, Milan, which is... Um, at Bocconi? You know, at Bocconi, yeah. So basically Bocconi is uh, arguably the best school in Italy. Um, and then after that I, I, I came uh, to Siebes. Okay. I'm very happy to be here, by the way. should have come uh, earlier. How did you get the opportunity to come to Siebes? Was it? Did you have the idea in your mind you'd like to go and tr lecture in China, or was it just an opportunity which fell into your lap? Well, opportunities must be created, okay? So I, yeah. I, I don't think they just you know, fall into your lap. Uh, I happen to have a long history with, with China. So when I was doing my undergraduate degree, which was in, in, in Belarus, uh, one of my uh, very good uh, friends, uh, realized early on, you know, back in the 2000s, uh, that uh, China was the future. Well, now it is the present, but you know, 20 years ago mm. uh, it was the future. So he learned Chinese while he was still in Belarus and he moved here. And so you know, uh, I've been visiting China for many, many years. In reality, Shanghai happens to be the city uh, where I have most friends out of any other city in the world. Uh, as time progressed, I realized that actually this is a country where I could you know, see myself you know, living. Uh, then I attended, attended one of the SIEBS uh, symposia uh, in the finance department. That's how I got to know SIEBS. Mm. And uh, I think the year after I, I joined. Do you remember the professors who were talking during the symposium? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, of course, I remember. All of them are my colleagues. Yeah. Just generally, what was the general impression you got? I loved it. Yeah. Um, and I still love it. Um, okay, so I had been coming to China for some time. And when was the first time? The first time was right after the Olympics. Well, 2000, right, 2009, 2009? Yeah, yeah around, uh, mm -hmm. around that time. It was a very, very interesting thing to see because uh, uh, China is just so very different from, from the rest of the world. You know, in terms of sheer uh, d dynamism, there are very few places in the world which, 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 which can match it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but it took me some time to then um, realize that the academic environment in China is also quite dynamic. Sibs is doing a pretty good job at you know, charging ahead uh, in the academic world. It's highly uh, underestimated. Is there some kind of academic opportunities you think were easier to get in China or were more available here? China offers two distinct advantages, distinct advantages. Uh, so advantage number one is that um, China has these, uh, you know, new developments which you cannot possibly observe, you know, anywhere, especially, let's say, in you know, fintech and finance. And advantage number two is that uh, in China you can actually make a difference as an academic, or at least you can pretend uh, yeah. that you can make a difference. Do you think China is more 
faster pace of development, so there's more need for people to come in and say, uh, here's some research which can help us advance more quickly in this direction or this direction. There is, you know, there are you know, plenty of examples, like, you know, uh, Chinese firms like, you know, Ant Group are investing heavily in, uh, you know, research intensive ways of uh, uh, changing their business models. Can you give an example of something like this, which you think Europe can learn from? I mean, just look at e-commerce in China. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just so very different from, you know, e-commerce in Europe. Uh, when you open Taobao, there are these, you know, videos and also the sales events by the uh, influencers. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, and there yeah. are many features about, you know, uh, the Chinese e-commerce specifically, which uh, Europe, you know, and the United States will have to learn from. Another uh, exciting, I think, development is this uh, idea of super apps. When Alipay and WeChat came out, I was, I think, in the United States. Uh, and I was looking at these, you know, super apps, which were doing presumably everything. And I thought, you know, what a ludicrous idea. This will never work. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I was, I mean, I'm not a really, you know, um, avid user of, of any apps anyway. Um, but then, you know, fast forward, you know, 10, 15 years and Facebook, I think, uh, is uh, thinking about, you know, implementing some of those ideas itself. Yeah. Uh, for a variety of reasons. Yeah. So I think there are many things that China can teach the world. And it will, it will. What is it about the Chinese environment, do you think, that makes it kind of a leader in e-commerce? The market size. Mm. And uh, so there's one more feature, which I think <coughs> um, is uh, uniquely Chinese, is uh, uh, the willingness to, to, to learn and to change, uh, to change behavior. Uh, people in China, in my uh, estimation, are far more willing to try out new things. Uh, in Europe, people are far more conservative. I am more conservative. It's very hard for me to download a new app and you know, you know, try out these new things. Um, but in China, I think it's far more accepted. We talk about, move on a little bit to specifically to your research. Um, can you tell us what you're working on at the moment? So I actually do research in, uh, in, in several areas. Uh, I think my primary interest in, is, uh, is in the political economy of finance. Mm -hmm. So I'm uh, studying the interactions between you know, firms and politics, mm -hmm. between courts and politics, uh, how finance uh, uh, campaign laws affect political outcomes mm -hmm. and uh, those types of things. None of this is related to China, at least you know, as, of, as, of, as of yet. But I am starting new projects. Um, that are related to how uh, Chinese fintech you know, changes consumer behavior, uh, changes you know, their portfolio allocation decisions. Uh, those are you know, all in you know, a very early stage, but you know, mm. I think there are many exciting things I will do uh, in the years to come with, with, with you know, Chinese, Chinese data and Chinese uh, uh, questions. I think one thing a lot of people who have an interest in business school, but maybe not exactly familiar with the day-to-day the -day life of, of a being a professor is, is it, how much of your time do you actually spend teaching, preparing for classes versus doing your pursuing your own research interests? Seventy percent is research and thirty percent is teaching. Nowadays, it's very hard to be a good teacher without being a good researcher, mm -hmm. uh, and the reason for that is because the world has changed so much. Uh, the amount of uh, <clears throat> effort that is invested in education today is incomparable to what you know used to be the case a hundred you know and fifty years ago. Uh, and of course, the challenges uh, that we face as a society in China and in, in the world is just so much harder. So you can't just go to a classroom mm -hmm. and uh, rehearse some talking points, uh, which I think is something that some of our students do not understand. You know, uh, many of them think that they come to a classroom to just observe, let's say, the best practices. And that's a uh, refrain which I hear quite often. Uh, and I am strongly against it. I, I think that education is one of the few markets where we should listen to the customer, but we should definitely not follow the customer. You know, if you go to right. a doctor, right, you can't tell the doctor, you know, what <laughs> prescription, you know, he yeah. or she should, you know, give you. You go to the doctor, mm -hmm. presumably, because you want to learn something, you know, that you didn't know before. Uh, and that is something that I think you should uh, uh, keep in mind when you go to school. The market research point you made is like you have to listen to what the students want, but at the same time, you, you are the teacher and you are the people with the knowledge who people are paying to learn from. So wh where is the balance between that? 
uh, everybody decides uh, on their own. Uh, now, if you think about your own prior uh, experience, uh, I, I can bet people who made the biggest difference in your life uh, oftentimes are the people who, at the time, you might even have hated. Mm. And so I think the, the balance is in the test of time. So I think uh, eventually the students will come back. So if they really think that you know, we have provided a, a service to them, uh, it will not be reflected in their current evaluations, but it will mm. be reflected in their willingness to come back, uh, take new courses and you know, learn from, the, uh, from their you know, professors. In some, some areas, there's a kind of awareness that the, the value of an MBA is somewhat less than it used to be. And as an MBA professor, do you have an insight into that? Do you agree with that statement? Well, I think the value of a traditional MBA is definitely you know, lower for two reasons. First, there are so many of them. Mm -hmm. um, so let me give you a slightly different analogy. So let's look at China you know, 20 years ago. Uh, you come here, you start a business. Almost anything you do is going to succeed, right? So what's the value? Like, no one had done it. Yeah. Yet. So yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, and the same applies to, 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 to MBAs, right? So you know, uh, 20, 30 years ago, there were so few of them that the skills we were teaching them uh, mm -hmm. were so uh, novel and unique that the people who were getting them they were just you no know, rarer, and they could. Uh, implement them much more effectively. Well, nowadays, many of the things that uh, a typical you know, MBA teaches uh, have been passed on through the generations of prior managers, and they have been like you know, ingrained into the corporate cultures. So we have to teach better, uh, better things. And I think uh, uh, the shift should be to uh, help our students learn how to think and not necessarily teach them the skills that uh, they could apply you know, mm -hmm. on the job. I mean, we should do that as well, but I think the work environment changes so fast that uh, the people who can learn how to think and how to adapt uh, will be far more successful than people who come here or anywhere else to any other business school uh, and just want to learn the skills. You know, the skills will, uh, will become obsolete very quickly. What would you say to someone who's, who's kind of considering CBS as a place to study an MBA? It's the best school in the world. That's what I would tell them. Um, but, uh, you know, honestly, I think uh, CBS is not for everyone. So it's a decision mm -hmm. that, you know, uh, they should uh, think through uh, very carefully. Uh, I think CBS is not a school for somebody who is not interested in China. You know, for many reasons. Mm -hmm. So if people mm -hmm. are not, in, if, if a person is not genuinely interested in China, uh, as either uh, a place where they would like to work or a place with which their future job will be connected, I think CIPS is not the right school for them. Uh, but if China is something that they are seriously thinking about, I think uh, there is no better school. What are some of the challenges you've found so far during your time working in China? I mean, obviously you were familiar with the country for a long time, so I'm imagining that a lot of the things before you actually started working here permanently were things you had either acclimatized to or you had some idea about already, <clears throat> but so far, what are the things which have been difficult for you and how have you overcome them? So there are so many things that are mm. different, uh, for better or worse, you know, in China. Uh, the attitudes are very different. Uh, you know, you get, uh, you know, small culture shocks uh, every day in China. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, literally every day. Now, if, if a person, uh, is obsessed about every minor detail of uh, the environment, they must not come here. <laughs> like they must not, <laughs> because yeah. it's gonna be yeah. uh, you know, an excruciating experience. Now, you know, if you can uh, live with these minor inconveniences, of which there are many, mm -hmm. uh, then I think the payoff is just so much greater. Just going back then to, just go back to your past, I'm very interested to think about comparing Milan and Shanghai. Because they're two cities which are often held up in the same sentence. Um, you know, they're both seen as fashion capital is a little bit glamorous and, and so on and so forth. I don't know that in Shanghai, there's some aspects of Shanghai which, you know, they seek to put the city on the world stage. And it's also always mentioned alongside Paris, Tokyo, and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. How, what's your experience been so far? So I would like not to compare them directly, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I personally prefer Shanghai mm -hmm. 
many times over. How long did you stay in Milan? Seven years. Seven years. Seven That's or quite eight. Well. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. know Milan quite well. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's a nice city, uh, but I like Shanghai much better. Yeah. Why? Uh, more dynamism, uh, and I think uh, there are many, many more things to do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and in terms of, let's say, that just you know, such a basic thing like you know, in terms of high quality food, I think on average Italian food uh, is great, probably the best uh, you know type of cuisine in the world. But mm. if you want to go to the really good restaurants, uh, Shanghai offers many more of them. Do you plan to stay in China for the foreseeable future? Do you have a a kind of fixed number of years or something like this? I am not planning to, le to leave anytime soon. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of uh, opportunities are here. Mm -hmm. uh, I am very excited about China. I uh, haven't seen much of it because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would like to explore the country. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are, you know, there are many things I would like to do. A couple of personal questions. Do you have any hobbies, interests? I like... Uh, Reading, I like uh, travel, I like uh, Jiu Jitsu, which is one of my less um, obvious hobbies. Actually, it's a great sport uh, mm -hmm. and it's uh, uh, developing quite rapidly in China, in Shanghai mm -hmm. in particular. So, I think mm -hmm. uh, you know, you'll see me in some competitions later on. Well, we we'll look hopefully, forward to that. Hopefully, yes. Is, I mean, is this like an exclusive revelation for, the, for this video? For this video, yes. Well, I mean, you know, uh, mm -hmm. let's not uh, hold our breath just yet. <laughs> okay. Victor, thanks for your time. Appreciate you taking the time out to tell us your story. And um, it's been very fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.